This is uh, the first proper mathematical epidemiology lecture. And what I'm going to cover in this lecture um, are models in a single population and the properties of those models. And I say basic properties, but we'll cover essentially the whole spectrum of properties that one can expect from models. But I will uh, point out that the models that we are going to be looking at right now are quite simple. Although that doesn't make their analysis any uh, less complicated, but uh, we'll see that as we progress. And I should point out before I begin that this will be a long lecture, uh, probably one of the longest. Um, it will go probably for more than an hour, uh, that's for sure. Um, so uh, what I will do is cover a variety of simple models. I'll start with the so-called Kermack and McKendrick SIR model, uh, which I will point out is what I will explain later is an epidemic model. Uh, then we'll look at an extension of that model. We'll talk a bit about incidence functions. Uh, and then we'll switch to a so-called endemic model. And in that case, it will be the SIS model. Um, I will then look at a slightly more complicated model than the SIS model, but still an endemic model, and then discuss properties of vaccination as well as global properties in the sense of uh, global asymptotic uh, behavior of solutions. Um, so let's start with the Kermack and McEnrick model. So I have talked about this in the introduction. Uh, this is a particular case of a much more general endeavor that Kermack and McKendrick uh, started in 1927. I really recommend I should edit those slides, point to every single one of the papers in uh, that sequence. Uh, but even that little one uh, that we're going to look at is just one particular case of a much more uh, complete model that they considered in this paper that is cited here. Um, it's quite a, a, an interesting and modern uh, take on epidemiology, although this paper is almost 100 years old. Uh, it still has a lot of what people still consider now. Um, now, uh, Underlying this whole Kermack and McKendrick approach uh, is essentially the following set of questions, and that has to do about the size of an epidemic. So it, in a way, we'll try to look at three different questions by looking at this model. The first one is, OK, suppose we have an epidemic peak. Can we always say that that peak is going to take place? If not, under what conditions does it take place or not? And then when a peak occurs, what can we say about it? Is it big? Um, how big is it? Because the size is important. If you're thinking about what happened with COVID, if, or what happens in general with a variety of, uh, of uh, epidemic diseases, if 30% of your population is out at a given instant in time, that's a very, very different situation from having a few individuals sick. Uh, so this is an important uh, problem. What is the size of the peak? Um, and the sort of correlated uh, question that comes with this is, well, now suppose that an epidemic wave has gone through my population. Uh, how many people were infected? And that's what's called the size, the proper final size of an epidemic. How many people get infected over the course of an infection uh, of an epidemic? Okay, so this is what we're going to investigate with uh, this model. Uh, so this is a model that assumes that there is no demography. So the this is a hypothesis that we can make from time to time in, in the Kermack and McKendrick case, that's an hypothesis they made. But essentially, when you make a hypothesis like this, you have to justify it. So how do we justify this? Well, the idea is that the 
period of time that we're considering the model for is sufficiently small that any demographic effects can be omitted. So natural death, natural birth in the population can be omitted. And if you're thinking about a disease that's unfolding, an epidemic that's unfolding over the matter of two or three months uh, or even a year, your population is not going to change fundamentally uh, its characteristics over that period of time. So that's a reasonable assumption. When you make it, you have to explain where you're making it. Um, and now what we do is we ignore these demographic effects and we then suppose, and that's a commonality with all the models, well, most of the models we'll be considering here, we suppose that individuals belong to what are called different compartments. And a compartment is just a little storage space, okay? So here we're going to say that individuals can be in one of three possible states and they can, they can only be in those states, okay? There's no outside uh, other possibility. So they can be susceptible to the disease if they are susceptible to the disease. So that means they can contract the infection and they haven't yet. Or they can be infected and infectious, both at the same time, with the disease. That's, there will be cases where you can be infected and not yet infectious, etc. But here we're making the assumption that infected equals infectious. While you harbor the disease, you're actively spreading it. And then once you are done with the disease. There can be two possibilities, but we lump them together. You can recover from the disease or you can die from the disease. But in this model, we don't make the distinction between these two events. We say you are removed from being infectious. And so you move into <coughs> the removed compartment. Incidence, which is, remember, the number of new cases per unit time, incidence here is assumed to be mass action. <coughs> and I will come back to explaining incidence in a little while. For now, just take it this way. So when we take these hypotheses together, what we obtain is the flow diagram that you have here at the bottom. <coughs> So this flow diagram is showing me how a typical individual will progress through disease stages. And these disease stages are compartments in our compartmental model. So they move from being susceptible to being infectious and infected. Uh, then into uh, the recovered, uh, removed uh, compartment. Okay. And the rate of movement from S to I is beta SI, so it's this mass action incidence, while the rate of movement from I to R is gamma I. So how do we model this? Well, we do so with a differential equation. So S, I, and R of T are functions of T time. Uh, and what we do, uh, and they represent the number of individuals who are in the S compartment susceptible, in the I compartment, or in the R compartment. Okay. So we count the number of individuals in the different states. And what we do is that we describe how these numbers change as a function of the fluxes, essentially, that are acting on the different uh, compartments. So, for instance, the number of susceptible individuals changes, so this is the time derivative of S, as this function minus beta, beta being a constant, times the number of susceptibles times the number of infectious. Okay, that's mass action incidence. When in 
when you take away individuals at this rate from S of T, remember individuals have to go somewhere in these compartmental models, then you put them into I of T. And this is this term that you're seeing here, beta S I, beta S of T, I of T. Okay, this is simply flow from S into I. And likewise, when an individual is in I, on average, they will spend one over this parameter gamma time units into compartment I, so infecting others, before they are removed and moved to the R compartment. And so this is that rate here that you find in the, I, in the R compartment. So remember, this is a differential equation. The unknowns are S of T, I of T, and R of T. They are functions of time. Uh, the parameters are beta and gamma, and the independent variable is time, uh, which just flows forward. If you take the derivative of t with respect to t, it's 1. So time moves forward, and these uh, unknowns, and the aim of a differential equation is to find the value of those uh, unknown quantities. And we consider this system together with initial conditions, and typically we'll write IC um, in the rest of uh, the entirety of the course. Uh, the initial conditions are going to be something like this. There's initially, at time zero, a certain number S0 of individuals, of susceptible individuals, a certain number I of zero, I sub zero of infectious, and a certain number of removed. Most of the time, we will actually suppose that this R sub zero equals to zero, okay? Because we assume that there is initially no removed. Um, I'll just point out, if you were to start with I of zero equals zero, uh, then substitute this into this equation, you get S, the derivative of S equals to zero, the derivative of i equals to zero, and the derivative of r equals to zero. So typically, we will always suppose that this initial condition in i is positive. Otherwise, we're in a degenerate case where we know that the model doesn't change at all through time. But it's worth knowing that this is something uh, that the model encodes. If you put no infection in your model, things remain the same, so the susceptible and recovered, uh, removed, sorry, remain identically equal to what you set them at the beginning. Now, uh, I had derivatives in there, you're going to see that, by the way, I should, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, that's what I wanted to do. I can move myself um, in uh, the slides when I'm obstructing the slides. Uh, so, um, typically, uh, and you're familiar with that, I have no doubt, uh, when we consider a differential equation, an ordinary differential equation, we tend to omit time and we tend to write derivatives as simply x prime like if if i'm considering the quantity x of t and i'm considering its variation i'm going to write it as x prime of t but i'm actually going to write it as x prime and likewise i'm not going to indicate dependence on time i just have to rem on the right hand side of my equations i just have to remember that my state variables are functions of time Oh, I don't show it. So in practice, the model that I'll be studying from now on looks like this. It's I've omitted the d, d over dt and I've omitted the dependence on t, but it's there. Okay, you have to remember that it's in the model. It's simply we're not showing it. And so the same thing, we're considering <coughs> initial conditions. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I've got a... <coughs> cut in my throat, or I don't know what the saying is. So, um, 
let's uh, now, uh, let me go back to the top, uh, let's look at what we can say. So if you remember, the first thing I said about this model was that uh, if we start with i equals zero, we remain with i equals zero and whatever we chose as initial conditions for the other two state variables. Now, one thing that we can see also, if we go back to the model, uh, is that <coughs> R, the state variable R, does not play a role in these two first equations. So in a way, we don't need to consider it. We can recuperate the value of R of t once we know what I of t is. So because we we'll simply need to integrate I of t to get the value of R of t. Okay. The second observation we can make is that the total population that we're typically going to denote by n, and it's simply, this is a function of time. Okay, remember, uh, there's a t in there uh, that I'm not showing, but n of t is equal to s of t plus i of t plus r of t, and I can differentiate this when I sum the three equations, because when I differentiate, of course, the uh, n of t, I am taking the derivative of the sum, which is the sum of the derivatives. This means that n prime is s prime plus i prime plus r prime. And when I take the sum of those three equations, what do I get? Well, this main minus beta si cancels with this beta si, and this minus gamma i cancels with this gamma i. So that means that the sum of the three is zero. So the total population in the model is constant. So that means I can reduce R. I can forget R anyway, because I can just write that that third variable is equal to the total population N minus the uh, sum of the two other variables. So from now on, what I can do is I can reduce the system to the system of two ODEs and that's what I will study, okay? Now, you know what happens when you have uh, an ODE, one of the first, well, typically you should also uh, check first that the solutions uh, do what you want them to do. And I'll come back to this aspect when I'm looking at, uh, in the practicum, uh, when I'm looking at um, how to analyze formally the problems. Uh, here I'm doing a, I'm doing an analysis, but I'm not going into all the details. But you have an ODE, one of the first things you typically do is look for equilibria. So when you look for equilibria of this system, you find that, well, you start with a second equation. And that second equation tells you that, well, either, and remember these are scalars, so either this is equal to zero, Equilibrium means I'm setting s prime equals i prime equals to zero. Okay, I don't want any variation of the solutions. So when I'm setting both of those equations equal to zero, I find that this is equal to zero, or this, and this is equal to zero. And this product is equal to zero if either beta s minus gamma equals zero or i equals zero. Okay, beta s minus gamma equals zero means that s is equal to gamma over beta. Or i equals zero means i is zero. Now, when I substitute these two solutions into the first equation, in the first case, I find this. I find that we get gamma over beta for s and zero. Okay. Uh, and the second case, when I put s equals zero in there, what I find is that any s, because if I put i equals zero in here, any s is solution. Okay. And that means what we have is what's called a continuum of equilibria. Okay. The entire s line, so the entire i equals zero uh, part of uh, the quadrant uh, is an equilibrium. This is going to make, uh, give us some issues. Uh, and I'll discuss this later. 
okay? Uh, this is part of the practicum. Uh, but for now, let me just say, this is a complicated situation. It's a, it's a super complicated situation, but it is a complicated situation. It needs to be dealt with some other way. For now, we're actually not going to do that. What we're going to say is, when, when we look at this system, we can actually do something with it. And let me show you what you can do. So the idea is that instead of considering uh, equilibria or so on and so forth, we consider the dynamics of I prime over S prime, okay? which gives us, if you think about it formally, it gives us this is I prime and this is S prime. So what it gives us is the evolution of I as a function of S, the differential equation that is going to help us express I as a function of S. Well, when we do that, we're taking I prime over S prime, I prime has this equation, S prime has this equation. So of course we need to suppose that S is non-zero which is fine uh, in most cases. I mean, so yeah, unless you take a critical case, uh, it is going to be true. Uh, but so assume S is non-zero. When you take this, what you find is that you're getting gamma over beta S minus one. And this is a, okay, this is a differential equation where S is the uh, independent variable and I is the dependent variable. So this is a simple differential equation. Okay. I'll point out that you have to remember that what we just did is we took time out of the equation, essentially. Uh, so this equation that we have, this equation three here, is an equation that describes the relationship between I and s, well, I mean, how i of s changes as a function of s, while s is itself changing. Okay, so it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than just <coughs> a function of s. Um, but we can integrate. And when we integrate, we find that i of s is this quantity, with c being the integration constant. And we find that integration constant by substituting the initial conditions into this equation. And when we do so, so s at time zero is s zero, i at time zero is i zero. When we substitute this into this equation, we find that c has to be this quantity. And because of that, the solution to, I should say, one a to one b, not one a, one b. Um, well, uh, yes, I've added C. Yes, I have R of S. So, yes, it's, it's legal. Um, so, I have, I, I find that I of S is equal to this, where I've substituted the initial condition. Okay. And likewise, I can get R of S uh, simply by saying that R is N minus S minus I of S. Okay. So, this is what I get. So this gives us the solution to uh, to the system. To sorry, gives us the way i changes as s changes. And so what we get is something like this. Here I'm showing you uh, I've normalized things, and this okay. I, I have a little word in passing. I'm not a big fan of normalizing uh, solutions. Uh, so here, what I'm doing, you see, I have one here and one here. I've assumed that the total population is n equals one. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is good. It, it helps, but you always have, in my view, I like to stay with numbers uh, because this gives you a better grip on what's actually happening. When you go to proportions, uh, this hides some of the uh, behavior. Uh, so. When you do this, it's always a good idea to come back to the original problem, which is not what I'm going to do here because I'm trying to give a sort of brief overview, but bear that in mind. Uh, 
so what we have here are solutions in the SI plane. Uh, and I should point out, so the initial conditions are either along this line or here very close to i equals zero. I should point out that this here is not i equals zero proper. It's i very close, i zero, very close to zero, but not equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so these are some initial conditions. These are some other initial conditions. And what you can see, so, and solutions start, these are the initial conditions. These are the terminal points here on the bottom, uh, bottom left. So what you can see is that in most cases, and I've taken, sorry, I should point out also, I've taken beta over gamma equals to 2.5. So what I see is that if you think about this is I of t, okay, so it's showing you what I is doing as a function of s. And you can see that what's happening here is I is increasing, then decreases. I is increasing, then decreases. Okay, if you look at its elevation. And somewhere along here, for instance, I is always decreasing. Okay, so if I start here, my infectious population always goes down. Same thing here, same thing here. And that's going to be something that we can study through this number R0. So it's got several names. I'm going to call it typically the basic reproduction number. You can read basic reproduction ratio, uh, basic reproductive uh, number, um, all sorts of vocabulary, well, of names appear for this, but here I'm going to say basic reproduction number. So we typically denote it R0. And uh, here, let me suppose that the total population is normalized again. So I'm assuming n is equal to 1. And I define R0 as this number that I described before, beta over, you remember I said beta over gamma is 2.5. So I'm assuming in this figure that beta R0 equals to 2.5. Now with this, let me move myself out of the way. Now, with this, we have the following result. Uh, um, by the way, these sort of green boxes are theorems, propositions, lemmas, etc. It's a result. That's how I highlight them. So let me consider uh, S and I be solutions to this in proportions. Okay, remember, I'm, I'm talking when the, in the case when n is equal to 1. And let me define our 0 as before. Then what we have is that if R0 times the initial number of susceptibles, which is here a proportion, okay, is less than 1, then I of t goes to 0 when t goes to infinity. If it is larger than 1, before going to 0, because I of t always goes to 0 in this model, okay, but before going to 0, I of t first reaches a maximum which we can compute explicitly, which is this number here, okay, and then goes to zero. So this number here, I should have localized on the graph, perhaps I will do that. Uh, this number here is this point that you can see when the i of t is maximum, okay. And you can see that here, for example, well, i of t would be maximum here, not anywhere later. So, uh, that's in terms of whether we see an epidemic wave. So we have an epidemic wave if this number is larger than one, and we don't have an epidemic wave if this number is less than or equal to one. But also, we've, there's another information uh, that we can derive from our zero. It is that we can find the proportion of susceptibles uh, well, first of all, it's a non-increasing function. That's normal. If you think about the model itself, uh, S can only empty itself. So that means the numbers in S are always non-increasing. Okay. So uh, S is a non-increasing function, but we can compute its limit uh, as this quantity here. And the, uh, so S infinity, and S infinity is a unique solution in this case of this 
uh, so-called transcendental equation that we have down here. Okay, so this is an equation that involves a quantity and a, a log of a quantity, or if you want to think about it the other way, it involves the quantity and the exponential of a quantity. So this is what's called a quasi-polynomial, uh, not a polynomial, because the part of the polynomial is exponentiated. Uh, so these can be complicated, but here this one we know has a unique solution, uh, and numerically at least we can find this solution easily. So this is linked to the final size of the epidemic, okay? Because if you want to think about it, S infinity is how many people remain susceptible when the epidemic has gone through uh, the system, which means this is, uh, if I take S of zero minus S infinity, that is going to give me how many people became infected during the course of the epidemic. Okay. And that was one of the questions we had. So we'll come back to that. Okay. So I just want to point out that this is something we can look at here uh, with this type of model, uh, so-called final size of the epidemic. So let me go back to the, to the top. Uh, now, let me uh, briefly uh, show you uh, an extension of this Kermak and McEnric model. So I'm going to point out that, as I uh, said, the um, Kermak and McEnric model was published in 1927. As you can imagine, there have been a lot of works published that use this type of approach since. Um, I'll point out a paper of Fred Brower uh, in 2005 quite interesting on the uh, topic. Uh, and what, uh, so uh, for example, for COVID uh, with a collaborator, I published a, a model uh, for COVID-19 that's based on this. I think I'll, I'll show it slightly uh, quickly uh, later in the course. But what I'm going to describe here is a model that we looked at um, in preparation for the, uh, well, for a, uh, pandemic of influenza, which turned out to be the 2009 influenza pandemic. Okay. So well, why, why did we need to extend that model? The idea is that if you think about the SIR model, it's a little too simple for many diseases. It's lacking in particular something that's very common with respiratory diseases, an incubation period and different pathway, well, not different pathways, but different uh, presentation of symptoms. So when, when you think about influenza or actually COVID-19, um, some people have very bad symptoms. People died from, died from COVID-19, but a lot of people also did not exhibit any symptoms. And so there are milder forms of the disease, but that doesn't mean when you're, you've got a milder form that you're not infectious to others. It simply means that you don't necessarily show symptoms, but you might still be infecting others. So this is something really to take into account. First of all, the incubation period, and I'll come back to that in spatial models, the incubation period is really important in terms of disease spread because most people don't travel if they're very sick. But if they are incubating with a disease, they don't even know they are sick and they can be traveling. So that really participates uh, in the spread of, of an infection. Okay. So in order to take into account these, these two uh, limitations, uh, we introduced this SLIAR model, uh, and I'll point out we introduced it in, uh, in a mathematical context, but it had been studied by others, for example, in, in agent-based models, which I'll describe later in the course, uh, before that. So, okay, so our, our model is like the formalization of these SLIAR models, but they had been studied before. Um, so very briefly, the model is like an SIR model, but we add two compartments to it. So we, bef like before, we have susceptibles infectious and removed. 
Although here, I'm going to point, oops, I have to get myself out of the way. Uh, although here, I'm going to point out that these are actual recovered individuals, okay? Let me explain. So, but we have susceptible, infectious, and recovered. Um, but we also add a latent compartment, and we also add, so latent, latency, in equals essentially equals i might discuss this in a bit more detail uh later in the course but i don't think so uh it sort of overlaps with the incubation period that's not always true uh but i'm going to just okay i'm sorry i had an issue with my camera i have to remember that the camera turns itself off after some time. Um, so what I was saying is uh, we uh, are going to, we have this I we, and we add this asymptomatic infectious uh, compartment. So what we have therefore is uh, movement into the latency and uh, as I was saying, so latency we're going to assume is essentially equivalent to the incubation period. At the end of the incubation period, and we spend an, on average one over kappa time units in L before moving out of L. So this is that rate kappa L that you see here. But then what we do is we separate this outflow from L into two parts by applying a proportion here. So you can think of this as a probability. So when individuals move from L into I or A, uh, there's a certain fraction P that moves into I and the corresponding one minus P moves into A. So kappa is a rate, L is a number, but these are uh, proportions, okay? P and one minus P are proportions. And another little interruption so um, you uh, as I was saying so uh, you can see the outflow being divided the outflow from L being divided between I and A and I, I point this out because it's quite important uh, uh, people uh, sometimes make mistakes uh, with these uh, proportions. So these have to be proportions, they're not rates. Um, or if you have a rate, you have to find things, uh, uh, write things another way. And the same way here, as I said, we have effectively recovered uh, individuals because we have a double possible outcome, a fraction F of the individuals who uh, leave the infectious compartment, uh, symptomatically infectious compartment, uh, recover. And that means a fraction one minus F die. So this arrow, and we're not counting them properly. So we are just allowing them to leave the model because you have to account for everything that happens within the compartmental model. So if we are going to have a fraction here, we have to remember that there's a corresponding fraction that's leaving the uh, compartment in another way. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a much detail of that model. I'll just point out that exactly like we did before, we can compute a basic reproduction number. And it takes this form, uh, or this form, uh, here, um, and we also have a final size relation, which, uh, so remember, it's S infinity or S of infinity. Uh, and so here we can solve for S infinity uh, as a function of the other known parameters in the model. Um, I will come back to this uh, in the practicum where I'm explaining how to uh, and analyze models because uh, there is a method for computing these uh, quantities and uh, I will explain it at that point. Um, for now, let me take a little uh, detour before we proceed any further. I, I have alluded to incidence functions by 
mentioning that in the two models that we just saw, the Kermack and McHenrick in this extension that I was showing, uh, we have, uh, oh, I should remember to put myself up here. And I, I, I uh, get less in the way if I'm at the top than at the bottom. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned that incidence function uh, used in the Kermack and McHenrick in this model were mass action incidents. Let me explain here um, in, in more detail what we mean by incidence because it's an important part of epidemic modeling. So uh, I recommend taking a look at this paper of McCallum, Barlow and Hone. Uh, it's from 2001. Uh, this is what I'm using here to, dis to do some of the discussion. Okay. So recall that in sort of, I'm going to say proper epidemiology, uh, incidence is the rate or number of new cases per unit time. So here we're thinking about a differential equation and therefore incidence is the rate at which new cases are generated per unit time. Okay. In practice, it is what describes the, the transformation of susceptibles into, um, into infectious. Oh, up. Okay move myself out of the way. Um, now, one first remark that I'll make is uh, you will also see another uh, term used, which is force of infection. And that's essentially two sides of the same coin. Uh, I'll just explain where, uh, where things differ. Um, so, if you write things this way as S prime equals minus some function of the susceptible, the infectious, potentially uh, also the total population. I mean, it can be all uh, state variables. Uh, when you write it just this way, you're typically writing an incidence function. Whereas if you're writing it this way as minus some function of S i and n times the susceptible population, then you are uh, describing what is called the force of infection. Very exactly the same, because you can easily see that you can lump this S back into here, or if you have an, any S in here, you can move it out, uh, so you can go from one to the other. I, I will point out in what context you're likely to see forces of infection rather than incidence functions. It's mostly, for example, in PDE models. Uh, in a PDE, and I have a short example some, some time uh, later in the course. In a PDE, when you're considering something like age of infection, you need to integrate over all the infectives that are present in the population. So for example, people that became infected today and people that were infected two days ago and, it's, and so on and so forth. And because of that, you think of infection as being something that acts on the susceptible population. Um, and I mean, as I said, we'll see that. Uh, of, in other contexts, it's not really important. Some people prefer force of infection. Some people prefer incidence functions. I typically use incidence functions, but there are a few instances where it actually makes sense to use force of infection. It's, it's not really important, but just be aware of the difference. Uh, now, interactions. So whether you're looking at a force of infection or an incidence function, it's essentially the same thing. What you're, what you're trying to do is describe the rate at which new cases are generated per unit time. And so I'll typically write it as an incidence function uh, this way. That incidence, the number of, well, the rate at which new cases occurs is a function of the number of susceptible individuals, the number of infectious individuals, and you will see later that it can be quite wide, uh, sometimes the total population. 
And what it does is it counts the contacts and then it describes the probability or some measure of how many of those contacts actually transmit uh, the infection. Okay. And I'll point out that choosing the good function is really hard and it's probably where we have the most problems. Um, by the way, let me uh, go back just a second uh, to this model, uh, just to point out. Uh, so here you see that asymptomatically infectious are infectious to others. So you can see that here, my incidence function includes in, in this model, I and A are infectious to others. Where uh, L is also infected, but not infectious but I and A are infectious and they contribute to infection differently. There's this coefficient delta here that says that typically the A's are not necessarily the same in terms of infection than the I's. So typically we assume that delta is smaller than one here. Okay, so this is another uh, an example of how, why is it that you will take on uh, S, I, but also perhaps uh, so as I said, choosing an incidence function is a complicated business. Um, there should be several uh, ways of approaching the problem. One of them is purely practical. Uh, some incidence functions will be easier to deal with mathematically than others. Uh, some of them are practical from a data analysis point of view. Uh, you might have data and you realize that a given incidence function works better than another one to fit that data. I mean, there's a variety of reasons uh, why you should choose, wh why you can choose a function rather than another. Uh, so let's look at the, the, the most common ones. So the most common uh, incidence functions are these two. Uh, the first one that we already uh, looked at is mass action incidence. So here it's just a function of S and I. Uh, and uh, it's simply the product of S and I. And we call that mass action because this mimics uh, what happens in uh, the theory of gases or in chemistry, uh, essentially you're saying that you have two quantities, S and I, um, and uh, of which there are S of T and I of T, and the number of interactions at a given instant in time of these S and I is the product. Okay. Uh, another uh, function that's used a lot is standard or proportional incidence, which takes this S and I, but divides it by S plus I. Okay. And to be generic, uh, I'm going to call beta the disease transmission coefficient. And I'm going to point out that what that coefficient means depends on the context. Okay. But that's why like disease transmission coefficient in a way is sort of all encompassing. So that's why I use this term. Um, now, if you think of this beta, this disease transmission uh, coefficient, well, remember that if x of t is the population in compartment x at time t, then the units of x prime is d x of t, so x of t being number, divided by dt, which is time. So x prime has units number over time. So when I have a differential equation, of course, what's left of the equal sign must equal what's right of the equal sign. And the units have to agree as well. So the units on the left-hand side must equal the units on the right-hand side. So if I have mass action incidence, for instance, what I have is some unit times number times number. Okay, so the unit, so this quantity beta SI has units beta times number times number. So this, remember it's S prime equals minus beta SI. So S prime is in units of number per time. So that whole thing must be in units of number per time. And in order for 
this whole thing to be in units of number per time, I need to have beta have units one over number per time. Okay, so here, in the case of mass action incidence, beta has units per contact per time unit. Okay. Whereas when you have standard incidence, you have beta times number times number divided by number, which ends up being beta times number. So beta times number has units number per unit time if we divide it, if beta has units per time. So in the case of standard incidence, beta has units per time unit. Okay. So this is important to keep in mind because when you're doing numerics, uh, oh, I forgot to... Yes. Uh, when you're doing numerics, this is something that you will need to take into account. I have to remember to look at my output monitor uh, to check that I'm not uh, in the way of the text. Um, I'm not in the way of the text. <clears throat> so let's go a bit further into mass action incidence. So here again, a mass action incidence, and I should have a function of n here, but n doesn't play a role. Uh, the idea is that there is homogeneous mixing of susceptibles and infectious individuals. And if you think about it from a sort of modeling point of view, this means each individual can potentially meet every other individual. Each susceptible can potentially meet every other uh, infectious individual. Um, there is a lot of discussion about this. Um, as I said, choosing an incidence function is not a uh, trivial task. Uh, and But one thing that you can think about, I mean, one way you can think about things is that probably this is a very appropriate uh, model in general uh, when the population is small. So if you think of a small location or like a room or um, a small city, something like this, it's likely that you can run into every other person. Um, that becomes more harder to justify when the population becomes large. Okay. Proportional incidence, though so here I've divided by n properly, uh, because I could have way more than s and i. Okay, I, I, like if you go back to my uh, s l i a r model, n is everything else. Um, so here, the idea is that every susceptible, for instance, if you think about it, you can write it as beta times s times i over n. i over n is the fraction of individuals in the population that are uh, infectious. Or you can think of it the other way, you can write it as beta i times s over n, which is the fraction of the individuals in the population that are susceptible. Okay, And there is uh, some discussion of this type of idea in uh, this old paper of Hefcott uh, from 1976. Again, with exceptions, uh, this can be thought of as pertaining to a, a population that is larger. Okay, because uh, if you think about it, um, well, suppose I have a, a city of the size of Winnipeg, which is about 800,000 people. I'm, I, it is impossible for me to run into every other person in Winnipeg. But what I'm doing is if I'm a susceptible individual, I, and there's a certain fraction of the population that's infectious, uh, I, I am going to meet on average this fraction of the population per unit time. Okay, if 10% of the people are infected, uh, I'm going to run 10% of the people that I'll be in contact with are going to be infected. Okay, so that's why typically we think of uh, standard or proportional incidence as being relevant in uh, larger populations. But I'll point out, if the population is constant, uh, so remember, for example, the Kermack and McKendrick model, n prime equals zero. So if the total population is constant, then the two forms are essentially the same thing, because you can think of it this way. So suppose that my total population is constant and equal to some n zero. 
then I have equality of my two terms if I define this beta tilde to be simply n0 times my original beta. Okay. The units of beta tilde and beta are not the same, but in terms of the effect on the dynamics, beta and beta tilde have the same type of effect. Okay, so when the total population is constant, it's not really important to worry whether you take one form or the other because they, with some little uh, trick, they end up being the same. Okay. Another type of incidence that was used a lot in the past is what's called a general incidence. And I'll come back to this later in this lecture because this was uh, the type of incidence that was considered by people who looked at the global stability of um, some type of epidemic models at the beginning. Uh, but if you think about these uh, incidence functions, they're uh, also, uh, they were introduced mostly uh, with data fitting, the idea in mind, because the idea is that these are two parameters, Q and P here, that you can fit. Additionally to fitting beta, this gives you two extra degrees of freedom when you're trying to, uh, to match your model responses to uh, whatever data you might have. So this is, um, uh, I mean, there are some, um, there are some uh, mechanistic descriptions of what this means. But you should also think about this incidence as representing uh, an ad hoc method of fitting data. Although, as I said, there are mechanistic interpretations, but I'm not going to go into here. Um, here's another type. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm following the paper that I was mentioning before uh, and following their, um, their uh, they have a little bestiary of uh, incidence functions, and I'm giving you a few there. Uh, so, incidence with refuge is an incidence that takes, uh, oh, I've got French in there, sorry. Um, uh, it's an incidence that uh, assumes that there's a proportion Q, the population, that's truly susceptible, and 1 minus Q is not uh, truly susceptible. And so, this allows to put aside this 1 minus Q fraction of the population um, and hide them from infection. Okay, so for example, you're thinking about spatial heterogeneities, but without modeling them specifically. We will see ways of modeling spatial heterogeneity more directly, uh, but uh, we can do that uh, through model within a single population. Uh, a negative binomial in incidence could be something you want to use. So you can see here uh, what happens is if you take a small value of this k here, uh, you have a very concentrated infection process, whereas when k goes to infinity, this essentially goes to a mass action incidence. Okay. There's something called asymptotic contact, which is uh, takes this form where f is one of the functions uh, that was described before. Um, so when what happens is when epsilon is zero here, the contacts are proportional to n, whereas when it's equal to n uh, to one, sorry, the contacts are independent from n. Uh, there is asymptomatic transmission, uh, which takes this form, and again. Um, that you can write in as a function of the other incidence function uh, that you've just defined before. Um, so this is another type of incidence. Uh, let me show you an example that I, I worked on uh, some time back uh, with uh, Conal McCluskey. We were looking at uh, an incidence function that would have a switch this way. So here uh, we've scaled things uh, so that the switch occurs when n equals 1. And what we had is we had an incidence function that was uh, mass action for small populations and uh, proportional or standard for larger populations. 
And what was very interesting in this model, for instance, is that so here we were not working with constant populations. So we had a birth and death uh, type process for birth. So B was not equal to D here. And we also had disease induced death. Uh, and when this was the case, there were uh, situations where we found that uh, this model had periodic uh, solutions. So you can see that with playing with the incidence function allows you also to uh, sort of make, give rise to uh, interesting dynamics. Okay, now let's switch to the SIS model. Uh, so the previous models, remember uh, the theorem that we saw stated that we had two possible situations. Either I decreased to zero uh, as T went to infinity without going through any, uh, a bump, uh, or we had a peak and then I went to zero. The model that I'm going to show you now uh, doesn't do this. And let me explain what happens. So I'm going to do uh, essentially the same as before. I'm going to consider close populations. And I'm going to assume that individuals in this population can be in two states. So it's even simpler than the model we were looking at before. Uh, there's no removal here. Uh, you can either be susceptible to the disease or infectious and infected by the disease. Okay. So as before, S of T will be the number of susceptibles in the population and I of T will be the number of infectious and infected individuals in the population at time T. Um, I'm going to assume that the incubation period is really short. And I'm also assuming that the infectious period, uh, so the infection lasts only a limited time for each person. So susceptibles, I'm going to assume that they're born at the per capita rate D. Uh, and that rate is going to be proportional to the total population. Okay, so per capita means proportional, uh, but it's proportional to N, the total population. Whereas the death rate is proportional to S, but it's also per capita. All the newborns are susceptible. So we don't assume that you can be born susceptible, uh, infectious, sorry. And infectious is the same. They die at the per capita rate D and they recover at the per capita rate gamma. We don't assume that there is any disease induced death. So the model is something like this. I should have said B for the birth rate. The model looks like so. So there is a birth rate that's proportional to the total population. I should have written S plus I here. Um, then individuals, if they come into contact with an infectious individual, a susceptible individual will become uh, infectious at this rate, which you can see here is uh, standard incidence. Individuals spend on average one over gamma time units in I before recovering and becoming susceptible directly again, or they spend on average one over D time units before dying. And likewise, susceptible are also subject to death and the average lifetime of a susceptible or an infectious individual is one over D. Okay. So I should point out, uh, this is an interesting, uh, characteristic that was not present in the Kermak and McKendrick model uh, is that what we are seeing here, these uh, multiple arrows uh, moving out of a given compartment, so say this I compartment here, uh, this is what we call competing risks. So the infectious individuals are subject to two risks. Uh, of course, one is a, really a risk and the other is what you desire, but in terms of uh, the terminology, we call them risks uh, nonetheless. So there, an individual in the eye compartment is subject to two competing risks. They can die or they can recover. 
Uh, and the average time, uh, so I'll come back to this uh, later in the course, but the average time that an individual will spend before they are uh, affected by either one of those risks, because these rates are exponential, and again, this is something we'll see later, uh, the average time they'll spend in I is going to be 1 over D plus gamma. The same thing here, but except that this is not an exponentially uh, distributed time. Okay, but this one is important and we'll come back to that later. So individuals can either die or recover. They are born here at this rate. They can, uh, they can become infected or they can die. Natural death. And so the model uh, looks uh, like so. Uh, so this is a flow diagram, uh, and so what you have, and I'm uh, here for now, I'm going to write B, okay, so there's a birth, death, infection, and recovery. These are uh, going, so this, this is putting in mathematical terms this flow diagram here, and I should point out flow diagrams are super useful. Uh, I, for me, for example, this conveys essentially as much information as this, probably more. Afterwards, of course, there can be more complicated processes that will appear in the equations and would not be necessarily apparent on the flow diagram, but altogether, a flow diagram, I think, is a very uh, good way of summarizing the information. So the model looks like so. So there's birth, death, infection and recovery and for the i compartment there's infection death or recovery okay and of course we consider the initial value problem consisting of this system together with uh, initial conditions that we assume to be non-negative uh, so what can we say um, yes the first thing is i'm going to assume that b equals t uh, this means that the total population will be constant. I'll come back to this. Uh, we call this model SIS for susceptible infectious susceptible. So typically when the, there's an S at the end of the name of a model, it's, it means that you can move back into the S. Uh, if gamma is zero, then the model is SI. Okay, so if you can't follow this arrow, so if this arrow is absent, the model is an SI model. Um, so you would remain infected your whole life, but of course here there's no disease-induced death, so you would remain infected your whole life. And so SIS models uh, actually work for some uh, diseases that are uh, caused by bacteria, such as uh, Staphylococcus, uh, Streptococcus, um, gonorrhea, etc. Okay. Let me point out, uh, before we go further, that death and birth, birth and death, are relative. Uh, I should point this out. So they're relative to the population under consideration. So if I'm thinking about this model, for instance, as a model for HIV, uh, well, you wouldn't recover from HIV, but think about the same model without recovery, uh, as an S HIV model, then birth is not birth. Uh, if you're thinking about HIV in an intravenous uh, drug user population, uh, you don't, you're not born uh, an IV drug user. Uh, you are born an IV drug user when you start using uh, drugs through IV. So birth is relative to the birth of the, uh, the so you're, you're entering the susceptible population. And likewise, death needs not be death. It is the death of you as a susceptible individual. So if we're thinking about IV drug use, if you cease using uh, drugs, then you're dead for the model because you're not susceptible anymore. Okay? So that's important. So, um, when you look at this model, it's a planar nonlinear system. That's about the best case, except a scalar uh, equation uh, that you can dream of in terms of analysis. 
but um, I'm not going to do it. Same way as the Kermak and McKendrick model, we, we use this trick of looking at I prime over S prime. I'm going to show you how you can study this model um, explicitly. And I should point out that this is not, like, this is a complete exception. Most of the time you would study things normally. Well, as usual. So, first of all, dynamics of S. So, of, of the total population N. So, when we look at the dynamics of uh, the total population, uh, we uh, sum uh, S, and, uh, S and I. Sorry, this should be I here. Uh, we sum S and I, and of course, the derivative of S plus I prime is S prime plus I prime. So, we sum the two right-hand sides of the equations. And what we find is dn minus d s plus i, which is n. So we get zero. So that means our population is constant. And whatever we take as the initial condition to the system determines how, much, how many individuals are in the model for all times. What I'm going to do here is go to proportions. So this is a tool that is very useful in other contexts. I thought it was worth introducing it here uh, in this very simple context, but there are other instances where you would use this technique as well. So the idea is that I'm going to use these lowercase letters to represent the, the proportion of individuals who are susceptible in the population and infectious in the population. And of course, because I'm looking at the proportion, the sum of the proportions is one. Okay, the total you you, are, you can think of those as a, almost as a distribution of the possible states to be in. You have to be in one of the two states. Now, when you compute the derivative of i prime, little i prime, you find this. Okay. So if n were not constant, you would replace i prime here by the equation for i prime, uh, capital i prime you would replace n prime by the equation for capital N prime. But here, n prime is zero. So that means that I can just keep this term here. Okay, oh, I had a problem here. I still need to fix a few slides. Um, so if I substitute uh, this into the equation, okay, I get uh, sorry, the, um, the equation, the I prime into this, I get that, uh, so remember the equation is here. And what I'm doing is I'm replacing I prime by the right hand side. Okay, so when I replace by the right hand side, I end up with this N squared here, N, N. And so here I have S divided by N times I divided by N, which is little s, and little i. Here I have little i, and here I have little i again. Okay. So we have a system in proportions, and furthermore, by the remark I made earlier, we know that the sum of s and i is 1, therefore I can just use 1 minus i for little s. So I don't need a differential equation for little s, I just need a equation okay if i know i of t i get s of t as one minus i of t and whenever i have a little s i can replace it with one minus i and so the system in proportion is this system s is one minus i and i prime is this equation here okay and once i know what little i is i can multiply it by n to get capital i and likewise for little s. Now, if I rewrite the i prime, little i prime equation, I get this. And that's the interesting thing here. This is a Bernoulli equation. Okay, you should uh, recognize it from your early ODE courses. And that means you can introduce this change of parameter. And that gives you a linear equation. Okay, and this linear equation is easy to solve. So you take, say, an integrating factor, you get 
uh, this quantity. Therefore, you get that u is given by this, which you solve for the initial condition. Uh, okay, c being the integration constant here. Uh, you solve for the initial condition. The initial condition, of course, is u of 0 equals 1 over i0. Uh, solve this, find your integration constant, and substitute back into the uh, Bernoulli, well, the uh, linear equation. Uh, you get this, and then uh, take 1 over this. I mean, remember that u is um, i, uh, the inverse of i. So take 1 over u, and you get this equation for little i of t. And you can see that here we have an explicit solution, okay? It's a function of time uh, that's appearing in these two terms. And a function of the other parameters. And I, uh, so maybe I'll, let me get to the solution. So remember that we also said that S of t is 1 minus I of t. So given we've got I of t, we write S of t as this. And what I want to point out here is this beta minus d plus gamma. So if you remember, I said the average time you spend in i before you either die or recover is 1 over d plus gamma. And we can see that this term here appears. So the sign of this is going to be important because I've got this term appearing here. Here, let's look just, or let's look just at i of t. So I've got the term appearing here, here for sign, and here as this uh, coefficient in front of the exponential. So if beta minus d plus gamma is positive, for instance, this is e to the minus some positive quantity, this goes to zero, and this goes to zero. Okay, And if it's positive, then this is positive, this is positive and uh, this goes to zero. So this tells me where things are going. Likewise, if beta minus d plus gamma is negative, this quantity here goes to infinity. Okay. Um, where, where am I? Where it's negative? Yes. So you, you can see that the sign of beta minus d plus gamma is of particular importance here. So, to summarize, if this is negative, then this limit is infinity, and so s of t goes to 1 and i of t goes to 0. Whereas if this quantity is positive, then this limit is 0, and s of t goes to this quantity, and i of t goes to this quantity. So you can guess what we're going to do. We're going to call R0, the basic reproduction number, this ratio. And so what we have is that if R0 is less than 1, this ratio okay, is less than 1. This means that beta minus d plus gamma is negative. Whereas if it's bigger than 1, beta minus d plus gamma is positive. So, and also, I mean, so this thing that appears in the limit here, also can be written as 1 minus 1 over r0. So what we have is the following result. We've proved this. If r0, this, this r0 that I've defined, is less than 1, then s of t goes to 1. So all the population becomes susceptible because i of t goes to 0. Okay, So s, the entirety of the population goes to s of t i of t goes to zero, so the disease is going extinct. Whereas where when r0 is larger than 1, then s of t goes to 1 over r0, and i of t goes to 1 minus 1 over r0. And that number, okay, it's, this is larger than 1, that number is between 0 and 1, but it's positive, and so the disease is going endemic. And this is summarized here. So when R0 is less than 1, so this is I star. So where, where does I go? What's the proportion of infectives in the population? I should say little I star, okay, not capital I star. Uh, 
what's the proportion of infectives in the population as a function of R0? Well, if R0 is less than 1, I'm in this situation here, I goes to 0. Okay, so there are no infectious, only susceptibles. Then when R0 becomes larger than 1, we go to this limit. I goes to 1 minus 1 over R0. So as R0 increases, there's a proportion, a larger and larger proportion of the population that's infective or infectious, and fewer and fewer individuals who are susceptible. Okay. And the situation is an endemic one. Okay, so this is this is the equilibrium situation. Uh, we're not going through a peak. What we are doing is we are going either to zero or to an endemic situation. That's why that SIS model is an endemic model, uh, not an epidemic model. Okay. Now R zero we will see again, uh, but. Think about it as uh, something that determines the propensity of a disease to become established. Okay, uh, so as a control policy, we are going to uh, try to reduce R zero to values less than one, uh, and this is coming out badly. Uh, but there's also a probabilistic interpretation of R zero, I should say, and we'll see that again. Um, or zero is the average number of secondary infections that you produce in a wholly susceptible population by introducing one infectious individual. Okay. So secondary, not, not larger, not more than one generation. So if I have one infected individual, how many others does that one infected individual infect on average? Okay, so that's what our zero is. And as I pointed out, 1 over d plus gamma is the average time of sojourn uh, in the I compartment. Uh, and beta is essentially the probability of infection. So our zero includes some, so it's how likely you are to infect others for the duration of your infectious period. Um, yes, and that's saying essentially the same thing as before. If R0 is less than 1, then typically you infect less than one person on average, on average, uh, and the disease is probably going to go extinct. Whereas if R0 is larger than 1, then you infect more than one person, and you're probably going to see, uh, I shouldn't say an epidemic here, uh, depending on the case, you'll either see an epidemic, a bump, or you'll see an endemic situation. Now, uh, here are some numbers uh, in, in evaluation of uh, R0. I'll, I'll point this out because measles is uh, a very infectious disease, and you can see this. Uh, so this means that on average, for example, this, this worst situation uh, meant that what we were seeing on average is that every infected person infected on average 16 to 18 people. So for uh, comparison, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has varied quite a lot, uh, depending on the periods and so on, but it's essentially between one something to about three or four. There are instances where we think it's higher, but nowhere close to this type of infectiousness. Uh, let me point out uh, how you would compute R0 normally. And again, this is something we will see in another lecture. Um, but the classic way to compute R0 is to think, and I, I, I will stress this, R0 is a bifurcation parameter. Okay, so the idea from a mathematical point of view, okay, so not the probabilistic definition that tells you that R0 is the average number of secondary cases, etc., but from a mathematical point of view, R0 is a bifurcation parameter. And so the idea here is to see, to compute R0 as the point where the disease-free equilibrium, and again, this is something we'll see more later, uh, where the disease-free equilibrium loses local asymptotic stability. And to do that, so here I'm normalizing the population to n equals 1. Again, I'm not so keen on this, but the computation is easier here. 
if I normalize the population to n equals 1, I have this system here. And what we call a disease-free equilibrium, so the, the equilibrium in which i equals to 0. So if I set i equals to 0, you can see that this equation doesn't change. And in this equation, these terms go away. And so all I have is here. Um, and so I get s equals d over d, so s equals 1. So this is the disease-free equilibrium. Then I will compute the Jacobian matrix associated to that system and evaluate it at the disease-free equilibrium. So I get this uh, matrix. And clearly, this matrix is upper triangular. So uh, this is an uh, eigenvalue. And the other eigenvalue is given by this. And surprise, that quantity is exactly the same quantity as uh, we found in the other analysis. So when we are doing this, we will say that Jacobian has, uh, uh, sorry, the disease-free equilibrium is locally asymptotically stable if the Jacobian has all its eigenvalues with negative real parts. In this case, it's all its eigenvalues negative because they're both real. Um, and so if beta minus d plus gamma is less than zero, the disease-free equilibrium is locally stable, whereas it's unstable when beta minus d plus gamma is positive. And by doing the same as we did here, by setting r0 equals beta over d plus gamma, we find exactly the same as before, and therefore we get the same behavior exactly as uh, we did before. And another thing that I'm going to show you again later, but that I'll show here uh, very briefly, is a method that's called the next generation uh, matrix method. And so that was introduced by Diekman and Hesterbeek and characterized in the ODE case by uh, Pauline Van den Rich and James Weltmore. Uh, and I'll explain, I'll come back to this, but I'll explain it very briefly here. The idea is that in this method, you consider only the infected compartments and you write the infected compartments x as this, like a vector f minus a vector v, where f contains, I, oh gosh, I need to edit this. this is, these are, f contains the new infections, and v contains all of the flows. So these are not flows within infected compartments. I will edit these slides. These are uh, new infections, and these are all of the flows. And then you compute the well, so-called Frechet well, derivatives, or if you want the Jacobian of these uh, vectors, uh, with respect to the infected variables only, and evaluate at the disease three, and you find the reproduction number as the spectral radius of this matrix F times this the inverse of this matrix V, which. Uh, and, and so sorry, and when you compute the disease-free equilibrium uh, this way and the R zero this way, uh, then you get this result that says that if R zero is less than one, then the disease-free equilibrium is. Oops, I should move myself outside. Uh, the disease-free equilibrium is locally asymptotically stable, whereas if it's larger than one, it's unstable. Okay. Um, Yes, I don't know if I, I was probably in the middle of the uh, frame before, but okay, so you take these derivatives and then you get this result. Um, so uh, there's conditions to check, and I will make them explicit in the lecture uh, in the practicum on computing. Uh, and I will give you an example that illustrates why it's important to sometimes check these conditions uh, in uh, the last lecture. Uh, so what we've seen so far in, is um, the SIR model of Kermak and McKendrick, which undergoes two potential uh, regimes, one where the infected individuals collapse and the other where they go through uh, first an epidemic wave. And uh, just a slight extension of this. And we also saw the SIS model. And in that case, it was an endemic model. 
uh, where the alternative is either the disease goes extinct or the disease invades the population and becomes established, therefore endemic. And I want to stress this. In both the Kermack and McKendrick case and the SIS case, we were able to derive essentially it, well, it, explicit solutions in some sense. I mean, the Kermack and McKendrick case wasn't a purely explicit solution, but we have some handle on the explicit value of some quantity, which is an exception. Okay, so I, I like to use these models because they are very simple, uh, but you should bear in mind that what we did uh, computing I prime over S prime in the Kermack and McKendrick or using a Bernoulli equation for the SIS model is an absolute exception. And most of the time you'll be carrying out proper, so to speak, uh, analysis of the systems. Okay. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the SLIRS model. Uh, so I just want to, um, this is a brief introduction. We'll see more of this later. Uh, so both the SIS and the SIR that we saw had instantaneous progression from S to I. The SLIAR extension to the Kermack and McEdring model had a latent period. And I, I want to stress here this aspect. So the latent period I, I mentioned in respiratory diseases, but it's not only respiratory diseases. Here I have a list of diseases together with the so-called incubation period. And you can see that uh, plague, Ebola, uh, Marburg fevers, they're in days and that starts to get long. Lassa fever, okay, one to three weeks. The tsetse uh, fly infection is weeks to months. HIV AIDS is months to years. So there are instances where the incubation period is really important and you can't just neglect it. So what I'm going to show you here is the SLIRS model. So we are going to assume there is demography. Uh, the new individuals uh, are born at a rate proportional to the population. I think this is not true anymore, but never mind. I might need to modify this. Uh, the disease is not transmitted vertically anyway. Uh, so all births are in the S compartment. There is no additional mortality because of uh, disease. So the death rate of infectious individuals is the same as the death rate of others. New infections, they occur at this rate. There is an incubation period. And also, when you recover, you are immune to the disease for some time and you might lose this immunity. So you move back into the L compartment, the RS compartment. So the model we have, yes, so I, I need to adapt this. This is not uh, individuals are born at a rate proportional to the total population. They are born at a constant rate. Uh, so the model works this way. So we are born at the constant rate B uh, into a susceptible class from which we can die. Or if we don't die, which is typically happening at a very small rate compared to the other things happening, uh, we can become infectious, infected. So when we become infected at this rate F of SIN, we move into the L compartment where we can still die in all other compartments, uh, we incubate with the disease for an average of one over epsilon time units. Once the incubation period is finished, we move into the infectious compartment. So this is an infected compartment and this is an infectious compartment. This is different in this case. Okay, so the, inf the latent are not spreading the disease, but they have it. And likewise, when I'm in the infected compartment, I can either die or recover from the disease at the rate gamma. So I can spend an average time one over D plus gamma in the I compartment before either dying or recovering. And finally, when I'm recovered, I can either die or lose immunity at the rate nu. Okay. So one over epsilon is the average duration of the incubation period. One over gamma is the average duration time until recovery. And one over nu is the average duration of immunity. 
So this is very similar to the model we saw before, except that we have this constant term here. And let me just mention uh, what happens because of this constant term, which is very similar to what happens in other cases. So if I look at the dynamics of the total population, again, I get this by just summing everything that's in the equations. Okay, uh, I get that, okay, so this term cancels with this one. This term cancels with this one. This one cancels with this one. This one cancels with this one. So all we are left with are B with a positive sign and minus DS, minus DL, minus DI, minus DR. So N prime is B minus DN. This is a very simple equation to solve. You, or you can study it qualitatively equally easily. Uh, so let me do it qualitatively, for example. Uh, so the equilibrium n prime equals zero is found by setting any, uh, n prime equals zero. So that gives me b minus dn equals zero, which gives me dn equals b, n equals b over d. And this is a scalar equation. Uh, we know it's monotone uh, in its uh, behavior. It's very, very, very simple to show this way or just integrate, whichever way you prefer, that what happens is that all solutions go to B over D. Okay. And so we say that the total population is asymptotically constant. It's not constant per se, unless I start at this equilibrium, uh, B over D, N of zero equals B over D, but it's asymptotically constant. I know it's going there. I can forget about the total population. So to compute the disease-free equilibrium, I assume S is I equals zero. And even if I don't specify the shape, the specific shape of the incidence function, you have to bear in mind that always, well, almost always, uh, you're going to assume that the incidence is zero when there's no infectious. Okay. Because you can't be infecting if there's no incidence, if there's nobody to infect. Okay, so typically we always assume that S, F of S zero and N is equal to zero. And from this, we deduce that L N equals R equals zero at the disease-free equilibrium. Okay, so if I set this equal to zero, you can see that here uh, I set the whole left-hand side to zero. I get zero equals this, zero equals this, zero equals this, and zero equals this. And then I assume that this guy is zero. Okay, F is zero because I is zero. So that gives me this equals zero. This is of course equal to zero because the I prime equation is equal to zero. But since I equals zero, this means this is also zero. Okay, so the disease-free equilibrium just has B minus DS equals zero. Oops, wrong side. Okay, so the disease-free equilibrium has L equals I equals R equals zero and S equals N. So that's how we denote it. So how would you compute R zero classic way? So remember, I said R zero is uh, from a mathematical point of view. Uh, the place in parameter space, and that can be a complicated space, uh, uh, place in parameter space, but it's the locum, uh, locus of, of points where uh, the disease-free equilibrium loses its local asymptotic stability. Um, and so you linearize. And I'll point out that this quickly becomes difficult. Let me show you, uh, this is not a difficult case, but let me show you how it works. So you compute the Jacobian matrix of the system at an arbitrary point. Okay, And these notation is uh, F sub L means the derivative of the incidence function F at, uh, with respect to the L equation, Okay, or with respect to the L uh, variable, and I variable and R, etc. Okay, so this is here. Uh, now, because n is asymptotically constant, the dependence on uh, variables that are not infectious variables are going to be zero. So fl equals fr equals zero. And so the Jacobian 
at an arbitrary point looks something like this. Okay. And now I'm going to evaluate this Jacobian at the disease-free equilibrium. And at the disease-free equilibrium, as I have pointed out, typically we assume that the derivative, so be careful, this is the derivative with respect to S. So think about the mass action term. So it's beta SI. When I differentiate this with respect to S, I get beta I. When I evaluate at I equals zero, I get zero. Okay, so this is what this is saying, uh, that most of the times the incidence function when evaluated at an endemic, uh, at a disease-free equilibrium is zero when you differentiate with respect to S. Anything that leaves an I in the equation is bound to be zero. Okay. On the other hand, when I differentiate say beta s i with respect to i, I get beta s, and s is non-zero at the equilibrium, at the disease-free equilibrium, therefore I, I have something left. So at the disease-free equilibrium, I end up with a matrix like this. Now this is a nice block matrix, you can see, so first of all, uh, there's uh, its block upper triangular if you consider it by taking out this block here. So we know that there's an eigenvalue minus d here. Now when I consider the remaining block, I can see again now it's block lower triangular. So this uh, matrix here has the eigenvalue minus d plus nu. And so I'm left with having to compute the eigenvalues of this internal 2 by 2 matrix that I've written here. Okay, so the eigenvalues are minus d, negative, minus d plus nu, also negative, and so the local asymptotic stability of my equilibrium is going to depend on the eigenvalues of this guy here. When I look at this equation, uh, I can see that there's some easy interpretations. I'm not going to go too much into detail here. Okay, there's easy interpretations here. Uh, if this term, for example, is uh, positive, then there's a single positive real root uh, using the Descartes rule of signs, whereas if this is negative, then there is no positive uh, real root, and therefore there's either a pair of complex conjugate roots or they're both negative. Okay. We could go on. Okay. You need to probably specify what this uh, function f sub i at E0 actually looks like, but you can compute this. But let me show you how you would do uh, things if you were using the next generation matrix method. And let me point out, by the way, because I've seen that quite a few times, if you're doing this method, you don't need to do this method and vice versa. Okay, so if you're computing the R0 using the next generation method, Compute it using the next generation method. Don't do the other method. Okay. So here we do the same, but remember uh, one thing I said was that you consider only the infected variables. So infected variables in the SLIRS model are just L and I. So we look at L and I and we write the system this way. This first vector is going to be the curly F. Curly F has the new infections. And the new infections in these two compartments are just the terms that come through the um, incidence function. And the everything else I put in this vector V with a negative sign, okay, be careful. So whereas it's minus epsilon plus D L here, it ends up being epsilon plus D because the minus comes out of the, uh, v vector okay so i have my vector f and v uh, of course i still have to carry out when i said don't carry out the analysis before you still have to find the disease free equilibrium what i mean is in terms of determining stability you don't need to do either methods but you're still doing the uh, computation of the disease free equilibrium so we know that the disease free equilibrium is n zero 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 now we compute the Jacobian matrices of curly F and curly V, and we evaluate them 
at the disease free equilibrium. So when I have this equation here, I need to differentiate with respect to L and with respect to I. And this, this vector here, I differentiate with respect to L and to I. So what I get is for F, I have derivative of the uh, incidence with respect to L and to I, and for V, evaluated at the, the V3, and for V, I have the derivatives with respect to L and I. Now, V here is a 2 by 2 matrix, so its inverse is very easy to compute. And uh, when N is constant, the derivative of L, uh, the derivative of the incidence function with respect to L evaluated at E0, at the three equilibrium, is 0. And therefore, F is just this term here, okay? The rest is zero. So when I compute F times this matrix V inverse, I get this term here. So this is a constant times this uh, block upper triangular, uh, sorry, this block upper, uh, this upper triangular matrix, sorry. And so when I'm multiplying this, and I, uh, so I want the spectral radius, the eigenvalues of this matrix are this times epsilon plus n0. So the spectral radius, of course, is this times epsilon. Okay. And I get my R0. So you can see that compared to this method where I wasn't even close to finishing at this point, um, this is much faster because it allows me to focus on fewer equations. Okay, and so we get this result. Uh, I'm going to assume that we can apply the theorem of Van den uh, what more. Uh, as I said, we'll come back to the conditions for application. Okay, camera problem again. So uh, I was saying, so assume that we can apply the theorem. And uh, as I said, I will cover this in another lecture uh, in the practicum. And uh, then you get this result that if this quantity is less than one, then the disease free uh, equilibrium is locally asymptotically stable. Whereas if this quantity is larger than one, then the disease free is unstable. I will stress, and I mean, we would get the same result from the other approach as well. Uh, but one thing that I want to stress is the local nature of this uh, stability uh, result that we deduce. Okay. I will show you instances uh, where even when R0 is less than 1, there are some uh, several positive equilibria. Uh, and what that means is that the stability is really local. Okay. Uh, so uh, briefly, uh, before I finish this, Let's look at what happens when we use the uh, sort of classic mass uh, incidence function. So if I have mass action incidence, then the derivative of the uh, incidence function evaluated at the disease free gives me beta n. And that means that the R0 looks something like this. Whereas if I have standard incidence, R0 looks like this. So you can see the difference is that this one involves n and this one does not involve n. Um, okay, the method that I showed you is applicable elsewhere uh, for sure. Um, let me briefly, before I finish on this aspect, uh, point out that you can, uh, from the SLIR model, you can uh, create a lot of different models. So you can you can sort of get all the particular models by making different assumptions on the movement, on the rate of movement from one compartment to another. Okay, so you can recuperate all of the uh, simpler models by just making assumptions that, for example, uh, there is no loss of immunity, therefore it's SLIR instead of SLIRS. Or if you suppose that the rate of movement from R to S is essentially going to infinity, so very large, then you spend virtually no time here and move directly back into S from I, uh, and so it's an SLIS, okay, and so on and so forth. And 
depending on what you're doing in terms of the models, uh, then you get different expressions for R0 uh, that we can compute generically um, as a function of the type of models. And yes. And now I want to spend uh, just a little time talking about two additional topics, the first of which will be uh, the effect of vaccination. So um, a very brief look at uh, the effect of vaccination. Um, so uh, we're going to go back to an SIR model, but instead of doing an epidemic SIR model, we're going to do an endemic SIR model in the sense that we're going to uh, use a demography. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, vaccination. And I'm going to add vaccination in a very, very simple way. I'm going to say that it's an SIR model. So R is for removed, uh, recovered, actually. I'm going to think of vaccine, uh, this model as being uh, SI re recovered. Um, and once you are recovered, you are immune to reinfection by the disease. So by vaccinating you, what uh, we are going to do is we are going to move individuals who are vaccinated directly into the uh, recovered compartment. So that makes them immune. Okay, so we have a flow diagram that you can see at the bottom. So we have birth into the susceptible compartment. So birth happens at the per capita rate dn. Okay, so it's the dn that you see here and here. But instead of being all of the birth goes into the susceptible compartment, as we've seen before, what we're doing is we're taking this birth and we're splitting it between, oops, between the uh, susceptible compartment and there's one minus p so p is a fraction and it's the fraction that's vaccinated at birth so one minus p goes into the s compartment and p goes directly into the r compartment so instead of flowing directly into s we can flow into s or we can flow into r the rest of the model is exactly like it would be if it were an SIR endemic model. Okay, uh, I'm assuming birth equals death, just to make things easy. And so, as I said, uh, we have a fraction P that's vaccinated at birth. And the uh, incidence function, I'm taking this very simple uh, mass action incidence. So that's the overall setting. Uh, which I'm repeating here, and you can see the model uh, then takes this form. So birth into the susceptible compartment, death. Uh, I forgot to put the arrows out for death, but I will add them. Uh, so death for, uh, of susceptibles, death of infectives, and death of um, rec uh, re recovered. Then there is infection happening at the rate beta SI, which moves individuals from S into I, and recovery from inf infectiousness, uh, which happens at the rate gamma I and moves individuals from I into R. Okay, so the model is very, very simple. It's like this. Now, let me compute R0, just to illustrate the effect of vaccination. So if I did not have vaccination. So I'm going to consider the same model, but SIR. So what would happen if I didn't have vaccination, that would mean P would be zero. So this arrow here is absent and one minus P equals one because P equals zero flow into S. Okay. There's only that upper flow that's taking place, not that flow uh, directly into R. So if I have this model and I compute the uh, disease-free equilibrium, I find that the disease-free equilibrium is everything is into N, uh, S, sorry, and the entire population at the disease-free equilibrium is S equals N, I equals R equals zero. Whereas 
when I have vaccination, now I'm going to write, I'm going to put the superscript V here on the disease 3 to indicate that we're in the case of vaccination. And when we have vaccination, well, at the disease 3 equilibrium, because there's an inflow, there's a continuous inflow of individuals also into the R compartment, then I have my disease 3, that is, the total population N is split between some R susceptible, and the, those are the ones that are not vaccinated at birth, and the ones that are vaccinated at birth end up being recovered. Now, I do the computation of R0, whichever way I want to do it, uh, probably using the uh, and then Rich and what more next generation matrix method, uh, but I compute my R0. So in the SIR case, R0 is given by this expression, beta over d plus gamma times n. Whereas with vaccination, we do the same computation, and what we find is that, let's call it R0v, so it's the R0 for the model that includes vaccination. Uh, that R0V is equal to 1 minus P times R0. And you can see again that if P is 0, so if I'm vaccinating nobody, then R0V equals R0. Okay, so when P is 0, these two quantities are equal. As soon as I vaccinate, I have an R0 with vaccination that is lower than the R0 without vaccination, which makes sense. By vaccinating, I am moving people out of the infectious class. And because they can't be in the infectious class, they can't infect others. Okay, so they are not contributing to the infection, therefore the disease is propagating less well. But, uh, so this is this observation that I'm making here, that the R0 with vaccination is always smaller than the R0 without vaccination, provided, of course, there is some vaccination. And same as before, so I have a new disease model, and if I want the disease-free equilibrium to be locally asymptotically stable, in that case it would be globally, but let's just think about local locality of stability. If I want my disease free equilibrium to be locally asymptotically stable, I need to make that new R0 with vaccination less than 1, which is equivalent to saying that I need to vaccinate. Remember, P is the fraction of the population that's vaccinated. If I vaccinate more than 1 minus 1 over R0, R0 being the the original reproduction number for the disease without vaccination, then I am in a situation where the disease is going to uh, go away. And I don't need to vaccinate P equals 1. You can see that it suffices for me to vaccinate more than 1 minus 1 over R0. So suppose, for instance, R0 equals to 2. Well, if R0 equals to 2, this fraction that I need to vaccinate is 1 minus a half. So it's 1 half. It suffices for me to vaccinate half of the newborns to put myself in a situation where R0V is less than 1, okay, compared to the original R0. So by vaccinating half of the population, I am setting the system in a, con in a context in which R0 is going, um, sorry, the disease is going to become extinct. And that is herd immunity, okay? It's the fact that, because what happens when you think about it in practice, this means that there are enough people in the population who are vaccinated. Think about an R0 equals to 2, as I was just discussing. So an R0 equals to 2 means that, on average, I'm, every infectious individual that I put in the population is going to infect, on average, two new people. Okay? And because of that, if we don't do anything, well, every time someone else is infected, they infect two new people, and so on and so forth. After a while, of course, a lot of people will be infected, 
and therefore we can't infect quite as much. And this is what's happening with vaccination. Of these two people that a new infected person um, is going to potentially infect, in that population, if I vaccinated half of the population, it means half of my contact randomly are going to be with people that are vaccinated and who cannot catch the disease. Therefore, these contacts are lost in a sense to the disease. The disease cannot use them to propagate and eventually the disease is going to go away. Okay, and that's herd immunity. And that's a notion that was really uh, put together by looking at mathematical models. Uh, it actually goes back all the way to Ronald Ross that I was discussing in the, uh, in the first introductory lecture uh, because Ronald Ross was looking at ways to eradicate malaria and he realized that you didn't need to eradicate all mosquitoes to get rid of malaria. Okay, and that follows the same type of idea. Uh, the, you can characterize a fraction of the mosquito that needs not to be infected in order for the disease, in that case malaria, uh, to theoretically go away. Of course, uh, obviously it's more difficult than this because malaria is still around, but you see the idea. So that's a very important concept and that's one that really uh, mathematical epidemiology helps pinned down in a, in a very satisfactory way. And the last thing I want to do is spend but just a little time uh, on global properties of models. And I'm going to use SLI RS models. And I'll start with a little uh, disclaimer that I might have made earlier, uh, but I'll make it here. Uh, so the models that I'm going to show you uh, were all written as SEIRS models, not SLIRS as I'm going to uh, call them. This is a little, uh, I mentioned earlier that there was a little problem with uh, terminology uh, and that is one instance where terminology um, ran into an issue. At some point in uh, days of yore, someone decided that the model, uh, the, the first stage of infection would be exposure. The problem with this is that in classical epidemiology, exposition to the disease doesn't mean the same thing as we mathematical modelers take it to mean. So exposition in the context of epidemiology, proper epidemiology, is the fact to come into contact who, with someone who is bearing the disease. But it doesn't mean that you acquire the infection. It just means that you're in contact at some point with the person bearing the disease. So if you're thinking about the, ma uh, for example, the mass action term, that would be SI, not beta SI. Beta SI is actual infection. SI is contact. And exposure, exposition is contact, not, well, in epidemiology, contact, not infection. So SEIRS models, susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered, should be SL or I, I for incubating or something like this models, not E. Traditionally, uh, they are called the CIRS and interestingly, a lot of people in public health completely understand that we are using the wrong term, but I'm just being a little bit pedantic and uh, I tend to always use L if I have a choice because I, I don't want any confusion with the notion of exposure in, in the epidemiological literature. Um, but as I said, I mean, you can talk with people in public health and they'll say, yeah, yeah CIRS, and we understand that the E is not E, but never mind. That's just a remark in passing. Uh, so I pointed out uh, in the very first uh, lecture zero uh, that I thought it was 
sometimes wasted to actually do global stability analysis. But I, I, I want to point out that, I mean, if you can do global stability analysis, it's great. It, once again, it really depends on who you are talking to. And this is a very important point whenever, like know your audience. If you are trying to, uh, to influence public health decision-making, don't worry about global stability. But if you are writing, for example, a paper that you will then translate into something that is more actionable in public health, then it's fine to look at global stability. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is, as I said, very brief, but I'll show you um, a few approaches. Uh, so the first model uh, that I'll uh, very, very briefly describe is an SEIRS. SLIRS models of Mukherjee, Chateaupadiai, and Tapashui. Uh, and what they did is they considered an SLIRS model, but with con constant birth rate, per capita death rate, and they used this general incidence function, okay, that I described a bit earlier. And they do uh, some analysis. I, I have the references to the different papers. I recommend that you go there. As I said, this is a very brief breeze through uh, these topics. So they define this Yapunov function, which is a classic in ecology. Um, and you will see, if I'll make that remark now, you will see that a lot of the uh, tools that we're using in mathematical epidemiology have been around in mathematical ecology for quite a few years. It's simply that we uh, transpose them in epidemiology with some delay. Um, but these things have been known for quite some time. So this is a Lyapunov function that you have seen if you've looked at ecological papers. Uh, so that Lyapunov function here, uh, they show that you can obtain conditions um, on the parameter values and g being um, uh, being the one of the uh, growth rates uh, here. Ooh, there's an issue with my notation here. Uh, but anyway, so they, they find conditions under which V is a Lyapunov function. And what you can see is that these conditions are not very nice. Um, so uh, quite complicated to check, but this is indeed true for your model. But this gives you uh, a way and this function you will see again uh, actually works in other contexts. Another model is um, and another uh, attempt at proving uh, global stability. In this case, it's not an attempt. Uh, is uh, this work by uh, Michael Lee and Jim Muldowney from uh, University of Alberta, uh, who consider this SLI R model, so no loss of immunity. Uh, individuals remain recovered, uh, so they're immune for life. And they again use uh, this general incidence function. And uh, so this is this paper here. And they show here that solutions uh, to the system uh, are actually uh, can be confined to uh, this simplex here uh, where uh, we're looking at the hyperplane S plus L plus I plus R equals one. And uh, on this system, the, on this um, um, on this set, uh, what they, uh, they show is that well, the system is dissipative and the global attractor of the system is actually contained there. So they, they're able to say, well, let's forget about the rest and let's work on this simplex uh, where the sum of the four variables is one. So again, this is a, a, a scaled uh, analysis, but this is the purpose of this paper is really the mathematical analysis. So in that case, it's completely fine to do uh, scaling. Uh, and there they show that there's an endemic equilibrium uh, and under these conditions on P, so P being the exponent here of I, um, under these conditions on P, uh, 
and on other parameters, uh, then there is an endemic equilibrium P star, and it is globally asymptotically stable in the interior of this set, which is uh, a set that is in uh, gamma. And I'll point out that the proof uses uh, what are called compound matrix results. Uh, I will say a word or two about this method uh, in another lecture. Uh, I'll just point it out because a lot of the initial uh, proofs of global asymptotic stability uh, that you can find in the mid-90s mid to uh, mid-2000s uh, use this type of technique. So that's why I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about it very briefly a bit later. But, okay. So this is how this is showed. Uh, another paper of Lee and Muldowney, but this time with uh, Pauline van den Drescher as well. They've added the S at the end of the model. So the previous model was an SLIR model. This one is an SLIRS. So immunity can be lost. Uh, they consider this incidence function, uh, which is more general than the ones we saw before. They've got some assumptions on this uh, component in the uh, incidence function. Um, they make hypotheses about the way this component behaves uh, when i goes to zero because of course uh, if you're not careful when the population uh, sorry the total infection so i of t goes to zero uh, you might end up with problems in your incidence function so they make some assumptions to make sure that the incidence function behaves properly uh, when i goes to zero. Uh, this is a paper in CAMQ, uh, and this one I've actually in included a link. The link here is to a ResearchGate version because unfortunately it's very difficult to find uh, CAMQ, CAMQ being Canadian Applied Math Quarterly uh, Journal. Uh, it is now defunct a journal and it's very difficult to find papers. But uh, So that one is uh, on Michael or Jim's page uh, on ResearchGate, and so you can find that paper there. So what they do there is they compute uh, R0, uh, not using the method of Van den Riesch and what more, because that hadn't been published at the time, but uh, they're able to show, so this is a definition. Uh, the system is uniformly persistent, uh, persistent. So if you don't know persistence, this is how you would define it in the case of this model that we're looking at here, uh, which is simply to say that the limit of all the state variables uh, remains larger than some epsilon uh, that is larger than zero. Okay. And under uh, this hypothesis that was made on the incidence function here, uh, they're able to show that if the incidence satisfies this, then the system is uniformly persistent when R0 is greater than 1. And that allows them to go further and to conclude uh, about uh, convergence to an equilibrium of the solutions uh, to the system. And again, this is a result that uses compound matrices, but again, I will come back to later. Uh, the last thing I'll mention in passing is a bunch of papers of Korobeinikov, who uh, did what I was mentioning before, took some uh, Lyapunov functions in ecology and uh, published them in, in mathematical FP. Uh, so, uh, this is an SLIR model or an SLIS model. Uh, he's looked at both uh, constant population. He has vertical transmission. The population is normalized at one, um, etc. So if you look at this model, uh, consider the equilibria. So the disease three has all the population in S, whereas the endemic equilibrium point uh, takes this form. You compute a uh, complicated R0, but I mean, it's uh, rather straightforward to obtain. Um, 
And uh, if you use this Lyapunov function, which is another classic in, epidemiology, in ecology, uh, then you can have this following result. Uh, if R0 is greater than 1, then you have a globally asymptotically stable equilibrium E star, which is this endemic equilibrium. And if it's less than or equal to 1, then you have a globally asymptotically stable DFE, and the endemic equilibrium is not relevant. And that's it.